I'm so proud of you. Good job. Hey, can you believe we're in November? It's November like 1st, 2023, just so, so that you know. Turn in your Bibles, you guys. Revelation chapter 8. Thank you for being here. It's starting to feel a little bit like winter, or is it? I don't know. Kind of had a little warm streak there. Hey, uh, the title of the message is The Seal of Protection Amidst Spiritually, or Satanically, I should say, Energized Times. And we're going to learn that there's a seal of protection upon, upon believers amidst a terribly satanically energized time during the tribulation. And so if you're new to our study in the great book of Revelation, I mean, essentially how you need to see this, they're talking about the last seven years uh, before the second coming of Jesus, what is it gonna look like? And, um, and the main channel that we need to keep turning up is, the, is who Jesus is, he's king, we believe it, he conquered the grave, we're secure in him, our, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Can I hear a big amen to that? Yes. So, look, Revelation 8, we're going to go verse by verse. When he opened, look at verse 1 there. When he opened, who is the he here? Um, it's the Lord. When Jesus opened the seventh seal. So, for those of you who have been studying, you know that there's a book like in the book of Revelation, and it's identified as a scroll, okay? And it's, it's broken up like in three different chapters. So there's seals, and you break the seals like a wax seal, and then you have certain events take place on planet Earth or in heaven, and then you have the trumpets, which we're gonna be studying tonight, and then you have the bowls. And the one that is holding this scroll, the, the big idea is, is that Jesus... In taking the scroll, it's a demonstration that he has taken control of the future. Jesus has taken control of the future. That's what this scroll kind of represents, right? So he is now unsealing this seventh seal. So it could be said like our precious Lord's hands that have been pierced with Roman nails, because he is identified as the lamb that was slain in heaven, right? A big idea there. I mean, we've talked about it many times. Sorry. The lamb was slain from eternity past, and we're going to be reigning with the Lord into eternity future, and we're always going to remember this genius plan of salvation that Jesus is the lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. So we just said a lot there, but I want you to hear this, seriously, okay? So the idea that he is now unsealing the seventh seal, it's like, okay, you know, it's a graphic, it's a picture. John is witnessing this and he's writing there. I mean, it's a picture that the Lord is in control. Just don't, don't forget it. Like, chapter seven and eight, not a pretty picture. Or eight and nine, excuse me, not a pretty picture. These seven trumpets, it, it's, it's like terrible what's gonna take place on planet Earth. Highly satanic, energized time as well. But Jesus has taken control of the future. And we're going to read in just a little bit. You have saints who are uniquely protected. We'll unpack it. What does that mean? Well, thank God for it. But look, here's the thing. We all have to agree on, on certain like basics of Christianity. And that is this. Just remember, Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the King. Can I hear a big amen to that? He, he's the Almighty He's the Almighty. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, right? He's conquered the grave. You know, as I mentioned earlier, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We just studied last week, it's like we see this innumerable amount of individuals in the presence of God waving like palm branches. It's a picture of victory. It's a picture of victory. So we know there's a future. Good news is we know that Jesus holds the future and uh, he holds it with nail-pierced hands, it could be said, that speak of his unconditional love and the assurance that the promises that are in him are going to come to pass. There's a pause here. Notice in verse 1, there's a silence in heaven for about half an hour. I mean, this is either inactivity or it's preparation for something. It's like there's a silence. It's an ominous silence, actually. It's the beginning 
of something super sobering that John is going to identify here. And since heaven is a place of constant praise and worship to God, silence for about a half an hour in heaven is a long time. You know, I just think of, if I could just go back real quick to Israel, I just think there was a little bit of a silence before the incursion there in Gaza. And it was like, you know, is, is, is B.B. speaking? The prime minister is like, it's like, it went silent for a while. Well, listen, they, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so much like inactivity. It was actually preparation for advancement. So when we read here, there's silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Um, I mean, inactivity or is it preparation? It more has to do with preparation. And notice verse 2, he says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Wow. I mean, this is quite a vision John is having. I mean, Jesus is like, you know, think of a Torah scroll or paper towels that you're unrolling, you know, and you got these seven seals and we've studied them and, and then they're going to turn into seven trumpets and it, it, they identify specific realities in heaven as well as on planet earth. The, the idea of angels stepping forward, oh, they're messengers of God. The fact that they have trumpets, you want to study the, the trumpet in the context of the Bible as a whole, because if you ask the question, I mean, how do you see the trumpet in Scripture? Oh, you see it in numerous ways. A trumpet was blown at Mount Sinai. So, so in the declaration of God's righteous standards, so beautiful, the moral code and the instructions for life, a trumpet sounded. Uh, trumpets are associated with unique preparation in getting right with God. So like in Israel, the shofar was blown. Could have Bruce blow the shofar, but he didn't bring it tonight. But I mean, blow the trumpet, and you know, your preparation for what? Um, you know, you're talking Passover and Pentecost and tabernacles. Um, you have the trumpet being blown, you know, associated with the Day of Atonement, blown in preparation for a war. Joel chapter 2, verse 1, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Now, I love the next picture here. You guys, check out verse 3. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came, stood at the altar, he was given much incense that he should offer it with the, what's the next word there, there, you guys? Prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne of God. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Beautiful picture here. Incense mixed with prayers reaching the throne of God. Look, I'm convinced there is something inherent in all of us that we want to touch. We want to somehow, you know, touch or experience that which is transcendent, that which is much bigger than ourselves because we know it exists. You know, it's interesting you know, when we talk about eternity, how can we wrap our minds around eternity? But we, we at least conceptually ha have the idea. It's like we cannot think of anything that doesn't exist. You say, no, 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 I, I can think of something that doesn't exist. Like what? Like pink elephants. Pink exists and elephants exist. You know, you can try again. It's like, you know, we can't really think of anything that doesn't exist, interestingly. And the Bible says eternity is written in our hearts. So the beautiful picture, look, instead of, don't get, don't get like locked up with like a censer and then there's incense and it's like, think of the meaning of it. Think of like you have the prayers like incense where it's aromatic coming before Almighty God in the presence of God himself. Whoa, that God actually hears us, that we can't touch him physically, but we can communicate with him. You know, it's like 
You know, sometimes, sometimes my prayers is simply, I love you, Lord. I mean, I was, you know, just got love to say, well, I love you. And I like to be saying that right now. I just love you and I adore you and just, nothing is greater than you. I mean, I mean, that's a prayer. I mean, just to think that that actually makes it all the way into his presence, I say that's great news, right? He hears our prayers. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hebrews 4 says we should come boldly to his throne. And it's, in other words, like totally transparent, authentic, bring our pain, identify our feelings. Jesus did. I mean, our Father wants that kind of relationship with us. All kinds of different prayers. You know, the Bible speaks of supplications. That's personal, specific requests. Intercession, standing in the gap. Thanksgiving, that's prayer too. Praise and worship, like what we were doing earlier. Water you turn into wine. I mean, it makes it into the presence of God himself. Beautiful. I can't touch the Lord physically, but I can touch him with communication, with prayer. I mean, what an incredible opportunity that is. And I think of Hebrews 4. I mentioned already we can come boldly to the Lord uh, when, when we're overwhelmed or even when we're not. But just think of our precious Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, sweating drops of blood. And I mean, totally transparent. It's like, you know, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. It's like, what cup are you talking about? He was just talking about the, I'm convinced it's the third cup of the Passover Seder. It's symbolic of the new covenant. So I'm convinced of it. So he's like, hey, if there's any other way for the redemption of man, you know, other than me giving my life, you know, I mean, he's just totally transparent in the moment, expressing his feelings. You know, let that speak to you. I mean, even right now, let me just ask you, man, if you're under duress and stress in things, like articulate it to the Lord. Can I hear an amen to that? It's, you should. I mean, Jesus was in touch with his feelings. Um, and the next scene is just so powerful. I just love this. And I'll tell you, I think this gives us extraordinary insight to Revelation itself. And that is the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth. Threw it to the earth. There were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. I mean, what is this a picture of? Is this a demonstration that the prayers of the saints are being answered? Oh, I'm actually convinced of it. Yeah, prayers of the saints are being answered. Like, like for how long have these prayers being have been, you know, making their way up into the presence of God. I mean, well, look, I'm convinced in context, these are prayers being answered for justice on planet Earth. I mean, earlier in Revelation 6.10, records the prayers of the martyrs. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. So like, look up here for a second. Watch this. Like our prayers for righteousness and justice and the Lord be glorified, it's going to be answered one day. On planet Earth. What a graphic, beautiful picture. Takes it, throws it, right? I mean, John is witnessing all of this, and, and, it, and it has meaning. So it's like we're in turn. What's the meaning of this? You know, this tells us there is such a thing as justice. I mean, we are a people of law, and we have a great judicial system. I say it's perfect. But thank God that we have legal process here. But our legal process does not always ensure justice. Like I think of what's happening in Israel. Like they're talking about, okay, you know, Israel's response should be proportionate. Proportionate? Proportionate? Well, what is I mean, I don't want to get off on this. Like, well, 1,400 people were just brutalized, murdered, raped, and everything. I mean, terrible even talk about this. It's like, okay, so what's proportionate? What, you do that to, you do that to the mosque guys, right? I mean, it's proportionate. Um, I mean, there is, there is such a thing as justice. I mean, in the legal process, you don't always get justice. I mean, people get away with murder, right? Not in the eyes of God, they don't. 
It's like, you know, personally, I think O.J. Simpson did. I think he just got away with it. There was a legal process, right? He didn't, he didn't go to jail, but personally, I think so. I hate to be wrong here, but that's what I think. But I'm getting older, and I'm just deciding to let it all hang out right there. There you go. Just like, <laughs> finally, i not even blushing. He got away with murder. The question is, will there be justice on the earth? Will the innocent blood that cries out be heard and be honored? Will the Lord be glorified? I mean, listen, he made us, he created us. I mean, when we sin, I mean, just by nature's defying infinite justice, thank God our sins are forgiven by the blood of the Lamb. Can I hear another amen to that? But it's like, will justice be known on planet Earth? Absolutely. And you know what? True and righteous are your judgments. So it's like, I don't, when I read this, and it's like, some of it's like, whoa. You're talking about third of the seas, you know, turning into blood, and you got astronomical issues, and you got really satanic stuff happening. Hey, listen, the Lord is in control. True and righteous are his judgments. And we should not fear the future. We shouldn't. It's like we're king's kids. We're in his hands. We're secure positionally. Um, So it says here, the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound ominous. First angel sounded and hail and fire followed mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth and a third of the trees, we're talking about fruit trees actually, that's the the word in the original language, were burned up, all green grass was burned up. Some see a parallel here to the judgment at Sodom. I mean, some see a parallel. It's not explicit, so I'm just saying, some see it, that you have such breakdown in humanity because we know, we know that wrath is building. The Bible says that wrath is the consequence of being outside of the will of God and one can store up wrath, kind of like a big snowball. Ultimately, there's the final day of judgment or the final day of wrath, right? So, like when I go through these trumpets, I'm thinking, hey, this is the time where wrath is snowballing and God is allowing breakdown and he's bringing accountability and judgment to planet Earth. So, consequences, third of the trees, grass were destroyed. And as I mentioned, we're talking about fruit trees, interestingly. Hey, you know, if we jumped ahead, which we don't have time to do, but I just want to quickly say, if you go to chapter 16 and 19, it identifies that during the last seven years, particularly last three and a half years before the Lord returns, that um, while the while there is wrath, breakdown, judgment on planet Earth against ungodliness, interestingly, unbelievers are not repenting. It says, like for example, Revelation 16, 19, they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Revelation 16, 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and did not repent of their deeds. Whoa. So it's almost like there's a consciousness, okay, hey, we are in sin. We're defying God. There's consequences to that. We know the consequences are associated with God, and yet we still harden. We're not going to give him glory. It's like, whoa. I mean, can a man cross the line of no return? The Bible does say, There is a sin unto death. I don't know what that is exactly, but I think we're reading a bit of it here. In Revelation 19, 19, I saw the beast. Listen to this. The beast, the Antichrist, kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Well, that's Jesus, actually, who returns. I mean, Can man get to the point that he's so stinking hearted, his conscience is seared, that you're fighting against God himself? And the answer is no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Because this takes place on a micro level. Thank God for his mercy. I mean, if we we are consciously sinning and stepping outside of God's will, 
I mean, that's an offense to the Lord. I mean, we need to raise the standard of righteousness. God help us. I'm such a sinner, and thank God for his grace. Hey, can I hear a big amen to that? Right, okay. So it's like, but hey, listen, you see it on a micro level. One day the world gets so stinking septic that they have a consciousness, yeah, and this is like, this is from God. But it's like, we're going to still, you know, shake our fist at him. In verse 8, the second angel sounded something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. Look, I want to remind you of something that John is, John is living in the first century. He's obviously a Jew. He's in his 90s. He's one of the original followers of Jesus. Beautiful man, gave us the gospel of John 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. John gave us revelation. And so what he's doing is he's like this heavenly reporter, and he's describing heavenly realities, and he's describing future realities. So, and he's doing his best to do so with 1st century terminology. Like, we, we talked about this before. It's like, you know, how, how would I... If I turned it around, I'm living in the 21st century, how would I communicate? If John was here, how, how would we communicate to him what an iPhone is? You know, it's like, that would be tough. It's like, John, it's like this. It's like this little scroll that has all the information of the world on it. You know, it's like this, but it's really, but I'm not kidding you, all the libraries and more. I don't know how we would do it. I don't know if we could do it. But um, interestingly, this description... This description is different than the next trumpet that we're going to read because this great mountain burning with fire um, doesn't come from heaven. So some see here, this is potentially nuclear. It's like a mushroom cloud. Maybe a description of modern warfare, like a trident missile. I don't know. Whatever the mountain of fire is exactly, The devastation is incredible. Verse 8, a third of the marine life destroyed along with the third of marine merchant ships. So I just looked up how many merchant ships there are registered, um, you know, today, and there's 118,928. So a third of them would be like what? Can someone do the math on that? Can you hurry up and do the math for me? So it's not what? It's like 30,000, right, are wiped out. Something that, like that. Look at verse 10. The third angel sounded a great star. Now, this is different. Fell from heaven. Burning like a torch, fell on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood, which simply speaks of that which is like totally bitter and you can't drink it. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Is this a meteor? Many Bible students want, okay, this, now this comes from heaven. Just this week, CNN headline, Asteroid that doomed the dinosaurs halted a key process for life on earth, scientists say. More convinced than others that the dinosaurs were impacted by an asteroid. Of course, we're talking these days about colonizing other planets. Do we have any volunteers that would like to do that? Say, Are you kidding? It's like, guess what? You're never coming back, right? Um, but anyways, look, we're, how do we interpret this? Well, you, you may, it's like you have this mountain of fire. You have this asteroid graphic. And in, ver, and in verse 12, the fourth angel sounded, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Well, it stands to reason that the first three trumpets would so impact the earth that it would create kind of a pollution canopy covering the earth. And, uh, of course, we, we know if there's a, a major vol- volcano, it can throw up ash in the atmosphere, darken the skies, pollute the waters, and so forth. And we know that Romans chapter 8 tells us all of creation, all of creation is groaning. That's... It's almost like there's a, you know, creation needs a chiropractic adjustment. That all of creation, that there's breakdown. We know we're subject to the second law of thermodynamics. 
We, we, we know that materialism, the material world, is not eternal, had to have had a beginning. And, and we know it's subject to decay. And, and we know that the answer, the Bible says, is the work of Jesus. It's a completed work of Jesus, and what's being longed for is the reign of Jesus on planet Earth with his saints. Verse 13, I looked, I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe. Not holy, 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 but woe, woe, woe. It's kind of a three-peat. In Hebrew, if you see three in, in a row, it's like over and over and over and over and over and over again. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Um, this ominous three-peat, because what we're going to read at this time and is that the next scene is satanically energized times, that's for sure. So let's get a good chunk of it actually here. Check it out, chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded. And I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. And to, like, what's the pronoun there? To him. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So this star is not a celestial being. It is a demonic being. And he opened the bottomless pit, smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. To them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So those who do have a seal are protected. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man in those days. Men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts. Again, it's like, I'm, I'm convinced these are demonic. You know, he's doing his best. They're like horses prepared for battle, like it. On their heads were crowns of something like, like gold. Their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and the teeth, their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like, like the sound of chariots uh, with many horses running to the battle. They had tails like scorpions, and, and there was sting in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abandon, but in Greek, he has a name, Apollyon, which actually means destroyer, a star fallen. So look, this is not a meteor, that's for sure. Uh, this is not a celestial mass. We have some background on this person. Revelation 1.20, for one, identifies angels as stars, and uh, angels can be good, they can be bad. In verse 11, it makes clear that the reference here to a star uh, is, the, is a king, and he is identified as the destroyer. Jesus said, the devil has come to rob, kill, and destroy. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus actually was witness of the fall of the destroyer, Satan. And it was a moral fall, not so much a, a physical fall, a spatial fall, but a moral fall. Revelation 12, we're going to talk further about this in the weeks to come. Satan drew one-third of the angelic host with him. He was judged by God. Job 
1, 6 through 12, Revelation 12, 10 tells us Satan actually has some form of access to the throne of God, that his mission is to accuse Christians of their faults and their sins and their shortcomings. But the good news is, is that we have a really good Jewish lawyer. Let me just put it that way. Okay, because the Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Can I hear another big amen to that? I love it, right? He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Love it. In verse 11, he's identified, as I meant, as the destroyer. He's given a key to the bottomless pit. And it tells us, It tells us Satan is alive. There's no doubt about it. And it tells us there are demonic spirits. But what this is telling us is some have actually been withheld by God. They've been incarcerated. Now, this can get quite deep, but just quickly, Jude 1.6 and 2 Peter 2, it says, The angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their abode, he has reserved. He has reserved in everlasting chains under the darkness for the judgment of the great day. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, cast them down to hell, deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for the judgment. I'm saying all of that to simply say that the picture here is is that, hey, during the tribulation, you're talking about increased lawlessness. And lawlessness, I'm just going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a connection, okay, a rational connection. I believe there is a connection. When you have increased lawlessness, and the tribulation is like a time when man is increasingly hardening against Almighty God. On the other hand, there's a bunch of people coming to faith in Jesus Christ as well. It's like the worst of times, and it's also a really good time with the gospel you know, being spread throughout the world. Even we'll get to this a little bit later, an angel preaching the gospel. And we, we read last week how you have this innumerable amount who come out of the tribulation. They're secure with the Lord. They're a part of the army that returns to establish his kingdom. But look, I mean, during this time, you just have an intensifying of demonic influence. You know, there are some cultures because of witchcraft because of, uh, you know, calling on the dead, going outside, going, going outside of the, of the boundaries of Scripture. You have cultures that um, it, it is the norm to actually experience demonic experience. I mean, we know that there are demons. He's not, de- let me back over. Satan is not the opposite of God. I mean, he's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. So he's localized, but the point I'm simply trying to make is is that when there's increased lawlessness, it is a gateway for demonic influence. And during the tribulation period, you have increased lawlessness, and I'm convinced there's a cause and effect connection here where you have then like room being given over to demonic influence. It's intensifying. And this is what John is seeing. And nine times the word like is used. I mean, the demons are like locusts. They torment like the torment of a scorpion. Faces like men. We mention these things. But uh, in verse 6, the torment is so bad that death is sought as an escape. Death is, is sought as an escape. And men cannot die. Hey, listen, if someone is an unbeliever, you know, death, death is not a release. You know, if, if someone is, not a, an, is an unbeliever, the Bible says it's appointed once for a man to die, then the judgment. I mean, you, you know, we all have had loved ones, for example, that have, as, as they've aged or they're battling illness, and it's just so terrible that they, they're, in, they're incarcerated in their bodies, and so death is a release, and particularly for a believer to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. But you have just like, man, these are radically, satanically energized time that the, 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 the wish is that these unbelievers are like, we want to escape this. But they are unable to escape. 
hey, it's a stinking nightmare, man. Right? Now, there's some good news in all of this. Um, because Satan's influence is limited. If you look at verse 4, it says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of, what's the next word, you guys? God on their foreheads. It's like the Lord restricts the influence of Satan's henchmen. They cannot hurt those who have the seal on their head in the most immediate context. That's 144,000 of the tribe of Israel. And, you know, I believe that 144, it's, a, it's, a, it's a per, like a perfect number. You know, some see that it speaks more than just the 144. And a lot of Bible students see believers, not just the 144, because 1,000 of the tribes of Israel but the reality is every believer is sealed by God. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And being sealed speaks of ownership, authenticity, safety. Every Christian is sealed by the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 121, 2 Corinthians 120. Now is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. And he set his seal of ownership on us. Put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Satan and his henchmen are not all powerful, not all knowing, not all present. Satan and his angelic hosts are created beings. And ultimately, they are under the control of Almighty God. And to be a believer, Satan is limited because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Believe it. Believe it. Can the enemy get like little strongholds in our life, uh, footholds that lead to a stronghold? I, I think so. Listen, you don't want to continue in sin. I mean, you don't, you don't want to be habitually a sinner. Like, we all sin, we all fall short, but there shouldn't be any area in our life that we're just like, well, that's going unchecked or unconfessed. You don't want to lower the shield of faith in your life. You know, you, you don't want to be practicing, you know, a sinful habit. And believers need to be on watch. We need to be on watch with regard to our thought life. The Bible says, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Listen, I got to meet the most wonderful sister, beautiful, incredible missionary in, Af in, Af in Africa, very difficult place where she ministers, very, very difficult. It's like, like super, super dark. I mean, it's like Hamas type stuff, and I'm not kidding. And they go from one place to another. Lord is protector. Like, her stories are amazing, and I mean amazing. But like six-hour trips, they're in the, in the car, and what are they doing? They're reading. They're in the Word the whole time. So she's trying to train some, you know, uh, you know some assistants and things. And, and she's like, hey, do, do you want to live? If we want to live, then, like, start reading the Bible. I mean, like, right now. Like, be in the Word. There is a battle. There's a battle for one's mind. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not physical, but mighty through God pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations. So ideas, ideas that would undermine the truth of who God is, we need to throw them down. You say, well, how do you do that? Like our Lord did. Like, you know, I was thinking about this today. Our Lord at the beginning of his ministry, he was assaulted by demons. I mean, I don't know how many there were, but he was assaulted by the devil. And here's Here's the sinless son of God. I mean, well, he's out in the wilderness. You know the story, right? The beginning of his ministry. And, and you're talking temptations that were stinking evil. Evil. That were trying to undermine intimacy with the Father. To, to just, get, just to get him off on a trajectory. And you know, we talked about that 61 ratio in pilots. You know, you take off. If you're one degree off of, you know, you know where you're scheduled to land, it's like for every 60 miles, it's like one mile off. So it's just one degree. 
and, and you're off by miles and miles and miles and miles potentially. My point is, is that if there's sin in our life, and we're not confessed and rightly aligned, it sets it in a trajectory that God has not intended for us. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he is assaulted. And what did he do? I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. He did RWS. You say, what does that mean? He replaced with Scripture. You know, he said, look, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds of the mouth of God. That's what I was getting to with this missionary gal. I mean, in a very dark place, just wanting her mind renewed, taking up the shield of faith. And and she was able just to move in power and victory. So look, um, can the enemy get these little, you know, footholds in our life? Uh, Yeah, I believe he can. Can he possess us? Absolutely not. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. But... You know, we can give him room by sinful habits, spiritual neglect, not watching our thinking, not replacing the battle with Scripture. God help us. Think biblically. And by the way, if you're going through a challenging time, you know, and whether you're demoralized or maybe even depressed, or maybe there's some form of oppression, I mean, like, man, just get in the Word like never before, seriously. Read the Word in the morning. Read in the evening. Reading at noontime. Identify specific scriptures. So if it's a temptation, if it's a a demoralizing, intrusive thought, how can you replace that with truth? Identify specific scriptures. You know, specific... Hey, listen, it may be, you know, Romans 8, 28. all, All things work together for the good to those who love God are called according to His purpose. So... It's like, man, I'm demoralized. I'm fearful about the future. All things work together for the good to those who love God. I mean, get the word in your soul. Christians are sealed in protection from the devil's attacks. Verse 12, one woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar in the tabernacle in the temple, the golden altar was the altar of incense. Um, In this case, it's representative of the prayers of the people. In verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river of Euphrates. Um, One commentator noted uh, that most of Satan's angels are yet free, being the principalities against which we wrestle. But some terrible offenders of high rank have been bound. Uh, And that is what is believed are being identified here. These are demonic. And they're connected to the river Euphrates, which is associated with with the first sin in history, the first murder, the first organized revolt against God. You're talking about the seat of civilization or Babylon. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month will release to kill a third of mankind. Aren't you glad you came tonight, you guys? Isn't this awesome? This is just like, hey, the Lord is in control, though, right? Right? And the number of the army, the horsemen, is about 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, blue, sulfur, yellow. The heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. Out of their mouths came fire, smoke, brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire, smoke, brimstone which came out of their mouths for their powers in their mouth and in their tails and their tails are like serpents having heads with them uh, and with them they do harm well um four angels release this horde of what what is this you know some bible students say well there's going to be an army that comes from the east You know, is this a reference, I mean, maybe to China? China at one time boasted of having a 200 million 
uh, man army. But uh, most historians actually believe that, that that's not the case. That's, you know, just to give you an idea that during World War II, if you put, combined all the armies together, I mean, uh, y- y- you would have 70 million. 200 million is a monstrosous amount. It's like, I, I personally believe this is demonic. That, that's, that's what I believe. And a lot of Bible students believe it. And the rest of mankind, look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. Whoa! That they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Wow. What, 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 let me ask you something. What comes to mind um, when you think of worshiping Satan, right? I mean, that's not the best question to even ask. But I don't know. The reason why I ask it is because worshiping Satan is much bigger than some, I don't know, some idiot rock and roll guy up, you know, on, the, on, on some stage. And, and he's singing about stupid stuff, Satan, and he's doing weird things, and he's saying 666 and things, and he's like vomiting. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's, that's a guy that worships Satan. And it's, and it's more, it, 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 so it's more than that. Um, what, what qualifies for worshiping Satan? I mean, do you have to be conscious, like intentional to worship him, or can it be done by default? Interesting questions. I think they're relevant questions. And the reason I raise that is because if you look at verse 21, check out verse 21. I think there's a connection here to worshiping Satan's idols. Idols are a God replacement, looking to something or someone to deliver what only God can deliver in your life, identity and peace and wisdom. But the next verse is telling in verse 20, they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. I mean, someone who has not repented, let's say, of devaluing human life um, in murder is worshiping Satan. So, I mean, if, there, if, if it's like there's an absence of repentance and one is looking upon human beings less than created in the image of God to the extent that they devalue them and it's like, you know, in their heart or in action, murder them. I mean, that is a sign. That's a reflection. of You're, you're not worshiping the Lord. You're worshiping Satan. So, I mean, I, you know, if you want to go back to Israel, like obviously Hamas, I mean, it's, interestingly, the next thing, re, re, look at this, re, they didn't repent of sorceries. The Greek word is pharmakia. And, and actually sorcery in the first century and, and even prior to that was associated with, with drugs that would alter one's state of consciousness. You know, Sir John Eccles won a Nobel Peace Prize on a study of the brain, and he proved that we are not merely material, that we're not merely biological, that there is a dynamic in our brain that is immaterial. He proved it. It sent shockwaves throughout the scientific community because it tells us that we are more than just, I don't know, educated beefsteak, or we're more than just, you know, biology. And we know that because God made us not only body, but he's given us a soul. And he, and he gave us a spirit where, which comes alive with a right relationship with him. Because after all, something died in the, in, the, in the garden and is made alive in Jesus Christ. It's very interesting because those, sorry, I mean, heavy, heavy study tonight. Can I hear it? No, no amen. Listen, Hamas, ah, got to get back to them. They were taking drugs. We talk about cavorting with demons. So they were like high on drugs, pounding the drugs. Um, and, and just getting back to the soul, you know, the soul, um, you know, consciousness is, is, is so difficult to define. In fact, science, scientists don't even know what consciousness is, but we know that we have consciousness and we know it's the soul of man. And it's and, and some have likened like well you know you got a you got a brain so you got a material aspect of who we are but our consciousness is like you know the person behind you know the the, the you know I'm typing 
and, I, and I'm interfacing with a hard drive on a computer. And our brain is a hard drive, and it's bi- biological and it's material, but our consciousness is immaterial, and it's interfacing. It's interfacing with our biology. So, th- so the idea of doing drugs is you alter your state of consciousness, you become more vulnerable for your consciousness to get bumped, to, and then to have another consciousness which is outside of yourself to take control of you. And man, um, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I can't believe what we see in our generation, uh, the, the legalization of smoke and pot. Did you ever think that was going to happen? I mean, I just, which of course is radically affecting not only soul, but is affecting the brain and the biology. It's just insane. Devaluing of human life, you know, you know, sorceries altering your state of consciousness. Someone who has not repented of sexual immorality. In other words, they're driven by instinct. There's a devalue of the opposite sex. I mean, man, it's not of the Lord. By default, you're moving in demonic realm there. Thefts, well, that's obtaining possessions illegally. It's another form of total disregard to one's fellow man. You guys, here's the thing, and I'm going to end with this. You never want to allow what you don't know to rob you from what you do know. You say, why would you even say that? Um, Because I'm reading this, I'm like, whoa, yeah. But guess what? I know he's the son of man I know for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I know Jesus gave his life. He loves humanity. I, I, I know of the security of his work of his spirit in my life, which is a guarantee. It's like an engagement ring that he's going to show up. We're going to see him face to face. And, and, and I, know, I know he's king, and I know he's coming, and I know he's going to reign. And so just bear, and, and, I, and listen, and he said don't, don't fear death. And I'm not even talking about now putting like the idea of death or inserting the idea of death in some eschatological framework. Okay, so let's just not, let's not go to the tribulation. How do we interpret this time period? Has the church been raptured? Has it been raptured? Hey, listen, many Bible students say, we're not even here to see this. On the other hand, you have some who say, look, the church goes through the tribulation, but they have a seal of protection. Okay, Look, here's the thing. Let's all agree with this. Let's agree with the ABCs. Jesus died. He was resurrected. He's, he, he, he's, he's alive. He's coming again. We're secure in him. All of us are going to die. In fact, the statistics on death are really impressive, right? And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. My point is this. Don't fear the future. I mean, you know what? Like, like the point of revelation is Jesus took the scroll. It's a big dramatization. He took control of the future. Keep our eyes on him. Live for his glory. Redeem the time. Can I hear a big amen to that? Let's all stand.